this other mathematician whose name I'm not going to reveal yet, but can in a year or so when he comes out with a book that we're going to be publishing. Um, he, he, he took me aside and said, you know, I, I, I love your new book, Return of the God Hypothesis. Um, he said, my wife's an agnostic, but after reading it, she's going wobbly, he said. Wow! But he said, I have a, I have <laughs> a beef cool with that? you. that? He said, you got, you got three way, you know, th- the three discoveries that reveal the mind behind the, the universe. He says, there's one more. It's math. And I had just read in a long essay that he had, he had written, and I kind of knew where he was going with this, but he, so, but he starts to explain. He says, all mathematicians uh, regard... Um, are basically mathematical Platonists. They believe mathematical uh, structures, equations, mathematical objects, as the mathematicians call them, circles, geometric forms, um, have an objective reality. A circle has all the same properties to every uh, geometer, irrespective of their preference. There's, right. We're not we're their not language, their, their location um, the, on the, the earth. The, the, yeah. uh, the quadratic equation or differential equations, they have certain properties and they are stable and they are mind independent, and yet they are independent of our perceptions, but they are conceptual. They are not physical, they are not material. So they're objective, they're conceptual, but they do not, but mathematicians believe they are discovered, not invented, they're in because they have a reality exactly. independent of ours. Well, if they're that, con- that, that's one of the great ideas of philosophy, right. Pythagorean, Pythagorean exactly. theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That reality exists, whether you're here or not, yeah, whether, the, exactly, whether exactly. the firmament is here, it doesn't matter, that's, that's a reality. So, that, so if they're conceptual, meaning mental, and they're not, and they're independent of our perceptions, in whose mind do they exist? And this mathematician, mm-hmm. uh, now wow. writing a book on this wow. with our colleague David Berlinski, says this seems to point this is deep shit. towards an immaterial mind, towards theism. And so Michael? you miss well, you miss that's a number three mathematician you, 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 you in the world. You miss something, Michael. Meyer. He said there was it should be that's, four that's four, so four cool. things that reveal well, the that's mind. That's so cool, though. What, 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 what an uh, endorsement! Let's see what numbers one and two think of that. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Son of a bitch. He had to get the number one and number two. Well, because, it, it, but, but again, how does science work? It's very much a collective social enterprise of trying to convince your colleagues that you've got something worth listening to and that you have evidence for it. Sure. And if you don't, well, that's just the way it goes. I mean, I get letters all the time from people that, you know, that they have an alternative theory of physics too. There's hundreds of them. Uh, but most of them. This isn't an alternative theory of math. This is this is a. Question. Oh, I understand. This no, is no, a question that's, of that's philosophy and yes, mathematics. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it happens that most mathematicians are mathematical Platonists. They recognize this objectivity and immateriality of mathematical objects, and that raises a question: If something's conceptual, in which mind does it reside? If it doesn't reside in ours, in the template in the sky, yeah. and that would be God. Well, okay, so that would be Yahweh. I mean, so take, take bake some basic laws of nature, like you know, the it, when when a star gets to a certain uh, temperature, it, it fuses hydrogen into helium, and you can describe this with math. All right, but where is that description? I mean, the, where is the math existing? I mean, it's not in the star; it's where? I mean, it's in somebody's mind describing, it, but it's at, the process is actually happening. It's out there. It's you know, separate so from us, isn't this it? Is, but but we but we use words to describe it, or we have mm-hmm. equations to describe it. You know, where are those? You know, this is a hard problem. It's, it's a great yeah. question, and it's one of the reasons that I think quantum cosmology, the alternative to a straight up Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God, uh, has its own theistic implications. Quantum cosmology does because the the explanations, the thing doing the explaining in quantum cosmology is a mathematical function called a universal wave function and an apparatus that stands behind that called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and superspace. There's this whole mathematical apparatus that pre-exists the universe, the physical universe. And the physical universe is explained as a consequence of the mathematics that God. pre-exists the universe. Now, yeah, the that. people, the, the, the guys at the forefront of this, not the popularizers, but people like Valinkin, have said, wait a minute, doesn't that imply then, aren't we then saying, maybe we don't want to be saying this, maybe inadvertently we're saying this, but doesn't that imply that there's a mind behind the universe? And Hawking himself tumbled to the, the, this uncomfortable realization. He said, what is it that puts fire in the equations that gives them a universe to describe? And what he's saying, he's building off of what Mike, Michael just said, is that math by itself has no, it, it's causally inert. It doesn't, it, it's, 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 it's just there. conceptual. It's, it's not a physical thing that causes other physical things to happen. Yes, it is. So, though. Well, but it, I mean, you, there are, there are theoretical theorems that later on, 
so so somebody writes a theorem. Uh, somebody dedicates his life to a theorem. They die at eighty five. A uh, hundred years later, somebody pulls that off the shelf. Well, that to is, use to measure that is X, a y, and crazy. Z. Th- this mathematician that I was talking about. Um, I mean, that's incredible. Th- to this me. is what his essay was about: is this uh, this unreal the, the unreasonable applicability of mathematics to the physical world? <sighs> Quantum mechanics was developed. Uh, uh, sorry, the um, the mathematics of of uh, complex variables. Um, was developed long before it had any application on the basis of pure deductions, mathematical deductions from first principles. And then 100 years later or so, it turns out to be absolutely critical to doing quantum mechanics. And there are many, many examples of this in the history of physics. What is it that provides, why does the, John Polkinghorne, the great Cambridge physicist, used to say, why does the reason within, the mathematics that we develop on the basis of our deductive reasoning, match and describe precisely the reason that is built into the universe, the design of the universe. And he says the best explanation for that is, again, theism. There, it provides a principle of correspondence that the same God who made the design, the rationality, the orderly patterns we see in nature, made our minds in such a way to discern the mathematical structure that is inherent in those, in those systems, and that's why we can do science. And actually, that principle of correspondence was one of the key things that inspired the scientific revolution. It was called the principle of intelligibility. And all the great theists who were the early founders of modern science, Boyle, Kepler, Newton, believed that nature was intelligible and could be understood by the human mind because the design in nature issued from the same intelligence, namely God, who made our minds in his capable, likeness, in his, in his likeness, likeness, so that we could understand nature. It's a hell of an argument. I mean, although you know, I should point out that some, since I, I can mentioned, feel Michael's skepticism. We, we, well, you mentioned uh, Max Tegmark before. Uh, you know, he deals with the same problems and does not come to the theistic conclusion at all. Well, he, so, he's always got to he's always got to bring he, he, the well, spoil well, sport well, into the party. Well, um, what Tegmark does is says that it says that every mathematical structure that's logically possible must exist in some possible world. And, yeah, um, not, not, I'm not sure, but my point was this. I'm not and sure Michael I'm and I are that. both skeptical yeah, about that. I, I don't know. That, that does nothing to undermine but, but the, the point is that argument. it's not necessarily the uh, right uh, uh, induction to the best explanation theism. I mean, you know, it could be that it, we're just going to hit an epistemological wall where we just can't know, like, what was there before the Big Bang? What, what was there before time began? Again, uh, Hawking's analogy, what, what's north of the North Pole? You know, what, how does something come from nothing? Well, what do you mean by nothing? Well, not, not only just no matter, space, time, energy, but no logic, no ideas, no gods, no nothing. Fi- no eternity. No laws of physics, Lawrence nothing. Krauss. Sorry, nothing. you're nothing. cheating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't even have no thing. I mean, the word itself, no thing, implies there's a thing that doesn't exist. True nothing wouldn't even be that. You know, there's there's no eternity because there's no time. Mm. Uh, at some point, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Right. You know, these words are just like, well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think um, for what it's worth, you, you make a hell of a, an argument to me. I've been romanced. <laughs> Damn, I was going to get you some flowers. <laughs> Michael still Take you holds out to firm. dinner. He still holds firm. I know. I'm a soft touch. No, it's it's, I'm a it's soft always touch. a great iron sharpening iron conversation with Michael. You guys are we, great. Yeah, and, it's uh, great. I, I, I always feel, first of all, I always enjoy the interactions with him, but I always feel like anybody who has interest in these deep questions, irrespective of what side of the argument they're on, is it's, to me a friend and a colleague, a kindred spirit. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that just go through life, you know, just don't want to think about it. They're not know? interested and, in the questions. And that's, yeah. that's to me, just not a, the unexamined life is not worth living, said Socrates. Mm-hmm. I kind of agree with him on I'm that. I'm right with yeah. him on that. Yeah. Well, and if I'm you're right, right, I guess I'll find out.